you in stereo. Got me in stereo. That's really nice. So I'm gonna. I guess I'm gonna be. And this is gonna be the round today. Um, I'm gonna not take a lot of time. Uh, I talked to uh, Owen Taylor with AgMax the other day, and he says you must feel like a bad man because there's not a whole lot happening. I said, well, I think there's a lot happening in uh, uh, in cotton. Sorry, and uh, uh, one of the things we wanted to talk a little bit about, and Carlos, if you could. Yes, just to talk a little bit about some of Carl's data that he picked up. Uh, to kind of give a, this will give a snapshot. I kind of want to talk a little bit about what the current situation is on the fields around uh, this area. I want to just uh, bring back a quick note about uh, watching for whitefly and sticky cotton. That will be on everybody's mind this year because we've had problems in the last couple of years. Issues, production, water, how do you manage a short -term crop that's going like, like it is on a short water season? So I want to keep mine to a minimum, but to let you know kind of what's going on. Pretty much anybody who's in a cotton field knows what's going on. I mean, this has been a, quite an incredible year. If it wasn't the exception of the, of the challenge of water, um, it's one of the earliest crops I think I've ever seen, uh, even this far north with the, with the way the blue is going. What you're getting right now is just a representative, a copy of, uh, of what I have up here. And this is, uh, again, I, 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 this is uh, the data that Carlos collects weekly from the field, from the old fields that are uh, in the Sustainable Cotton Project. And uh, let's just start with what the crop is doing right now. And right now, the, uh, the fruit is going really well. It's, uh, it's holding well above any above the expected levels. Again, uh, this model was set up for a Kayla. We were sort of integrating it, or extrapolating, if you will, for Zara and, um, and Pima. Uh, it's a little bit different, but still the the, uh, the fruit is sticking nicely, both on top and bottom of the plant. And if 70% of the fruit was holding at the bottom, that's what this thing represents, then uh, any, any number above this line basically is saying above expectation on the cotton in terms of uh, where the fruit should be holding. So currently everything is looking really good. It's holding uh, anywhere from, if you look over in this column here, on this, on this little chart, uh, you can see the actual enrolled fields and the fruiting branch, the percent top, percent bottom, and then what you expect to hold on the top. And we're running between 70 and 90% uh, uh, retention on the first position and everything from about 70 to uh, high 80s on retention on the bottom which is just really a really a phenomenal uh, 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 if you will end of early early fruits it's, 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 it's looking very good um, from a bug standpoint this is his uh, his uh, the data from the entire year from June to present and uh, the while the ligus which is these two red numbers here uh, have gone up a bit they're still at a you know you're talking about a scale here of five insects per 50 sweeps uh, it's still at a uh, a very reasonable level for this time of year it's a combination of what your plants holding and the number of ligus that you have both uh, both adults and immatures and right now everything is pretty good Quick question of the growers and PCAs in the audience. And how many people have traded for Ligus so far this year? So there have been a few treatments going on. There's a, there was some Ligus out in, uh, in the uh, earliest part of the season, uh, the time when it's most critical. I was watching. Uh, there's some, been some work done out of uh, Davis with uh, Jay Rosenheim, uh, professor up there at Davis, who looked at a lot of PCA information over a number of decades, and he mined it, and he did some fancy statistics to it. And one of the uh, things he found was something we knew, but really pointed out obvious that uh, during that earliest part of fruit, he just used a month of June as an example. Uh, it's really critical that light density be managed, and, and he had really, really low numbers indicating that if you allow you know any almost any damage in the uh, in the Set during that early it affects yield in an immense way. But 
really July and August is, is much less. It, it really doesn't impact that yield as much if you've already set a good crop uh, or a good food set prior to that. So it's really kind of a uh, your low numbers early are more important. The further we get out, particularly with a food set like this, the more we can at least take a few, not a lot, but you know, enough. Uh, this time of year, anything from a five count is this. There's not anything to be really get too uptight about. Uh, but to be watched closely and manage, you know, watch what your plants do. Um, benefits with insects are still uh, declining. The most, the most um, abundant one is uh, Big Eye Bug, which is for me good to hear because, again, Jay's got a student who's working with Big Eye Bug. And he says he's finding some evidence that it's getting harder to find them across the Central Valley. And something seems to be going on with the populations. We don't know what. So he's asking for some information about people seeing a decline in big eye bug populations. Uh, I couldn't tell you if this is high or low. Because I got mine on too before and it doesn't go off. Um, so, uh, so we do have a good collection of insects. We've got some really good crop. Uh, the crop is developing quite well. Anyone seen white fly in this area? Sweet potato white fly. You, you saw some over there on the you saw west side of the valley on uh, I-5 there, yeah. yeah. It's probably maybe for a bunch, so but the numbers of adults are increasing. Yeah. You haven't seen a lot, but for sure, you haven't seen a lot of things. Yeah, you've got a lot of melons out there, and it seems like an area that most of have a good population every year. Yeah. Um, last year, we had some real problems with white pine. We had a lot of continual invasions, and apparently we had a few areas where they got away from the PCA. Resulted in some pretty in substantial sticky cotton going into some of the gins. So we've just been told over and over again to, uh, to remember that we, don't, we can't deal with sticky cotton. We absolutely need to prevent it. We don't want to try and get into the mills and the gins afterwards and try to mitigate the problem. So we got to watch those uh, those little rascals closely. And as you as you, you know, we have very very good um, uh, sampling techniques. And we have excellent products as the population begins to move in, starting with the IGRs, and then eventually as we move toward the end of the season with, uh, with just some cleanup products. So if you ever get any questions about it, your PCA, tell them not, don't hesitate to call us out if you've got any questions on it. Uh, you know, we're there to work with you. Uh, this morning, I got word that uh, if you didn't attend any of the white fly sticky cotton meetings that uh, C uh, the Cotton Growers Association and UC held back a month ago, points of that presentation were captured and it's been narrated and it's now available as sort of a webinar and uh, those are interesting. Like, uh, I'm sure you'll be seeing where this is because uh, the cotton growers will be putting out where this link is but uh, I have a, uh, a, a, a description of San Joaquin Valley situation with sticky cotton and then Peter Ellsworth of Arizona is going to be publishing his uh, his presentation here shortly going into more detail about how they handle the uh, the sampling system the role of beneficial insects in Arizona, and uh, I think a more thorough discussion of some of the uh, chemical control approaches. So keep an eye out for that. If you've ever get any questions about it, you can just click on there, and you've got a slideshow with a narration over the top of it. And if you send us that link, we'll put it on our website too. Very good, very good. Yeah, I'll do that as well. Um, so what yeah, I, got, I got on? that email this morning. Thanks. Good. So um, I did miss your meeting. I apologize, but could you maybe put it in front? Of, in, it is is the North Valley? Let's say Mer Merced County in particular. Is, is is it just as much of an issue here as it is Fresno South? Or let me just say that uh, it wasn't a uh, uh, really. It sort of was uh, mostly in the uh, one of the big concerns was in the lake bottom down into Kern. But they always had the problem in Kern, and they were able to manage it. They usually have a problem in the lake bottom. They just had to. They just had to apply more sprays. It tended to be a lot more adult fly in. But once we got up into the into the uh, five points area, there are just some just some areas that somehow or another are spotting with some fields that really. But once we got north of that, there wasn't there weren't any complaints of uh, growers and white fly, and there wasn't any complaints from the gin as well as what uh, was reported. But uh, but I think the persistence of the of the white fly last year, at least in the five points area, I know caught a lot of people kind of by surprise because it get used to the idea that you're far enough north or 
there's enough shallow ground, there aren't as many melons and everything that they weren't going to be there right. and stay, and they did. Yeah, and I think there, and that's what we had. A, we had a meeting in January over the West Side to try and figure out. You know, we had Jenners and merchants and PCAs and growers in that meeting, and the consensus was the PCAs felt like. You know, it was a little more difficult to control because the populations were persistent, as Bob said. But there was also a sense that, you know, we, we may have a little bit more inexperience. We haven't seen them for 10 years. And when I got the call, I had to go get back at the stuff that we did in the mid-90s. re-educate myself. We had to see them for that long and, uh, at, this, at this particular uh, level. And so I think just a lot of people said, well, you know, we have a little white flag here. I'll, you know, we're not... People aren't checking cotton as much cotton as they used to, so I'm wondering if there's a little bit of experience there. Uh, whatever it is, is that the point is, is that uh, the PCA has all said you got to get it early. You got to make sure that you, you get it to, you're in the field frequently. You get the population at that treatment level, which is fairly low, get in there and start treating and control that because it's a population management issue. So uh, uh, I'm going to let this guy pass. Uh, stop there and maybe we'll point. If you got any questions, you can point them later. If not, we can, we can move on. But so far, so good. Just watch the white flag. And I would also say that there's been a few reports of aphid around too. We never want to get the aphid out there potentially causing uh, that was actually my question. <laughs> I was wondering what you've been hearing. I mean, I know like in Westside, we've been dealing with aphid populations for about three to four weeks. And it, they were real spotty to begin with, but then they expanded, and then we have a couple of varieties now in the South Valley, where there have been aphids popping up you know, about the last few weeks. Are we finding uh, both the light and dark form? Yes. Yeah, see, that's what we had in the mid-90s, mid-80s, was the... Uh, the appearance of this darker form of pine and it seemed to be more reproductively active. Uh, and a quick, little quicker generation. It seems like a little quicker ger uh, uh, generation turnover, that type of thing. So, you know, again, it's been a number of years since we have widespread problems, and it, we do have good materials now available that we didn't have back in the, the mid 80s. But uh, uh, again, it's something we have to watch. And the, and the real key, the real problem I have with managing uh, aphids is. They really don't harm the plant. I mean, you can take a lot of, you can take 50 aphids per leaf today. And if tomorrow you have an open bowl, your threshold is five. So it's one of these things that, well, yes, not only hurting the plant until the lint is exposed. So in other words, we've got to be managing those populations you know, prior to the, uh, you know, the, 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 the lint beginning to be opened and exposed. So it's again, it's a, uh, currently we still have to hurry. Again, I'll remind everybody that uh, particularly in the period of uh, August, when it's really, really exposed and we're beginning to get some, some uh, aphid or even just on the top of the plants, the greening. Cotton is one of the few crops that was exempt from the ozone VOC requirements for um, Lorsban or Chlorpyrifos, um, in this case Lorsban. That's the one that tends to fume more. It's why it does put out it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a, uh, a VOC producer. But Cotton made the case that we really needed to be able to put that thing on, get it into the canopy, fuming. Otherwise, we're risking the entire crop. So, just a reminder of that. In late season, we do have the, uh, the, the the EC version still available, and there's other products available as well uh, that uh, that have good fume. to sale at 1.6 and get about 90% on your aphid? No. Uh -huh. So we've retreated to sale in Lord's Bend. What other good products might we have put in instead of Lord's Bend? Well, you already used your neonicotinoid when you put the sale on and then when you repeated it, you know, you would have been, you know, you probably wanted to have another mode of action.
Can I mention? Sure. Yeah, Sorry. we have a new formulation for our final boss uh, called Balkan. And what it is is it's a VOC formulation, uh, VOC compliant formulation, but it uh, is still fumes. And what we're doing is we're replacing the harsh solvents, the things like the Aromatic 100, that's the primary solvent in the, 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 the chlorpyrifos 4E. We're replacing those with organic oils. So we end up with a product that's, that's still oil soluble. Um, in the case of Balkan, it's VOC compliant, but just barely, it fumes right up to the limit. And our objective when we were building that product was to come up with a product that was VOC compliant and would, that would perform as well as 4E. And the reality is, in the heat, the 4E actually goes off too fast, the Balkan's much slower, and as a result, it will out, actually outperform 4E on. So it's a very good formulation of as a caution label instead of a warning, um, still the other posting and those requirements are still there. Well, I, would have, I would have rather that the assail worked the first time. <laughs> well, and it, and it worked the same way everywhere in the field. It wasn't like the plane right. missed a spot. So it just left a couple of live ones. But you don't have, but you know, 90% isn't. Uh, that's a passing grade by my standards in high school. But uh, would you have? Uh, insects just not there to, to pick up the, the, the difference in Is it being seen more in the area this year than in years past? It's, it's around us. Uh, around the other growers, you know. For sure it's the green or the darker, darker the, the green. Well, I definitely say scattered locations down through the valley. Yeah. Much much more in the way of aphids that seem to hang in there for several weeks as opposed to part of what I have a problem with, I guess as an agronomist, is we've gotten nicely trained that probably five years is that a lot of the aphid populations that were hot spots would actually really nice to go away all the I don't know. 
those and the PCAs on the west side are my point here calling me saying, are we sure that this thing's not going to be getting in there and taking small squares out? And uh, so we're trying to follow up on that. Um, this white fly that's acting differently. Uh, and, you know, and I, you know, I don't know. It, it, when you have these kinds of things fairly widespread with multiple pets, kind of tells me there's something big like the environment that's impacting. I think the dry winters, the warm winters, the high survival we're having, uh, in the past, maybe the white flies were kind of beat back to a certain location. They came out, they were beat back this year. They've been, the last couple of years have been able to survive and spread out quicker. Um, you know, these aphids, we haven't seen problems for 30 years with them. We've had problems in the last two with particularly this, this area's been hard hit. You know, I, I, I just think you know, my sense is, is that, you know, we, we've got some really, I mean, this is, this, this is one of the earliest monsoons we've had through. Decades. So between heat and humidity and all sorts of things that are changed, warm winters, lack of rainfall, lack of moisture, lack of tuny fogs, you know, I just think things are kind of out of kilter. We hopefully we'll, we'll go back into kilter when we we'll go back on when things kind of go return to somewhat semi-normal. But uh, you know, so Bob, I guess what I'm leaving you with is, is yeah, it, under normal years or years that we have for the last 10 years, it seemed to disappear. Right. We haven't had really aphid problems since the bad ones. Either. Maybe it's cycling back in or some such thing, just to be aware of. And, uh, you know, again, I think we got better products now than we had 15 years ago when we had to fix them. So um, uh, I'd say stay, you know, stay vigilant. And, uh, again, it's uh, our, biggest, our biggest concern. I suppose was, the was last thing I was going to be saying is that uh, we'll keep you up to date as much as we can about what's going on in the Palo Verde Valley with the brown stink bug. They had a real bad problem last year, and we're hoping we don't get it up here because it'll tear up a late season crop through the badly. So we're, we're watching that fairly closely. And as with the conspur stink bug in tomatoes, or even the brown marmorine that surrounds the country, which is about the other parts of the country, we don't have a lot of products that kill stink bugs. I mean, they're really difficult. The ones we have are older materials that DPR and EPA don't really want to re-register. So it's a real, kind of a real tough thing if we start to get some of these stink bugs in the hand into large plant bugs like that. We put it uh, commonly in uh, uh, comments that uh, we're going to have some, you know, we're going to have a challenge until we get some new uh, crop protection materials that come in and go after some of those critters. So uh, we'll try and keep you up to date with what's going on in Palo Verde that Bonnie Barlow is, uh, is facing with and some of his control uh, projects along with their University of Arizona. So any other final parting comments you guys want to try and hit me with? Last chance to stump the chunk. What's the best way to kill those beetles? So we had some in our habitat the, in the buster. So we treated with pretty chloride. The There's no best way. It depends on the, it, it, it depends on, you mean the beetle, you mean the. Uh, that little one they talk about, the frightened. Oh. oh. Yeah, the, I don't know. Did it work? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we did a backpack first. We spread a hurry. Killing this work that are too killing work. Yeah, I haven't heard anybody. I think I've heard a couple of treatments because for the most part it's not doing anything. It's just kind of chewing on some of the leaves. It may chew on the, the fruit bracket, but it's not causing any trouble yet. And so that's why I wanted to get some collected to make sure that's exactly what it was. Uh, and we didn't get something else that, we, that I'm mistaken it for. So we're going to get a, an evaluation. So it, it sounds like a pyrethroid might be working on that. I'm thinking more of It doesn't of the get very big, it just stays kind of small. Yeah. yeah. surprises me with the lack of rainfall even when we've had is this yellow mustard that's all over the place. You know, that yellow, that small potted mustard is both a good ligus host and I guess it's a good host for all sorts of things like false chinch bug and maybe pale striped flea beetle, whatever. Can't say that maybe that mustard would be an average. I'm not sure yet. <laughs> Have you done studies on that or thinking that it's a, a good, or does it bring in stuff that gives you trouble? I'd, I'd have to look at that. Yeah, I'd have to look and see just what the what the what the flowering pattern is in your uh, in your scheme of things, and again, also what people report bringing in. There are some plants you really don't want some of your some of your hedgerows, and some of your. Is this is sustainable habitat. Yeah, we planted at the same time we aired our first irrigation. Oh, the okay. This is the so uh, later. This is in marshes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But we've been using that mustard in those habitats for ten years. There has been question of you know, they bring in ligus or they yeah. have been enough steady. Mustards are generally a good uh, ligus host, but at the same time, maybe that's what the hand is supposed to be. They're beneficial insects and they're supposed to be drawing things too. Maybe that's where you're getting your first established one. Maybe you're prepared for 
legitimate field. One can argue that, but I don't have any data. Yeah, yeah.